Hey. It's nice to hear children, right? Running around in the church again. Well, today um, we're going to continue in our um, in our look at Acts. We're going to be in chapter four, verses one through uh, twenty-two. But to begin, I want to read a little bit from John, uh, the book of John, chapter 8, and just a couple of verses, verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'm going to read that again because it's so short. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is the word of God for the people of God today. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. That's right. Well, um, Mao Zedong was the um, chairman of the Chinese Communist Party years, years back. And he is credited with coining the term paper tiger. Now, he was referring to uh, those paper floats that you might see in a, in a Chinese New Year's parade. Um, but what he was coining the term as to mean is um, anything that seems super threatening or, or powerful, but that really isn't. Now, he used that term a lot referring to the United States. He believed that the United States was full of bluster and threats, but that the will of the people of the United States was like a paper tiger, that they would just sort of crumple up and blow away with the least little bit of pushback. Now, you don't have to go to geopolitics to uh, know about that idea of a paper tiger. We know people in our lives who are... They're by, bark is much worse than their bite. Uh, we've seen, if you've lived long enough, uh, cultural trends and maybe huge crises that with just a little bit of time or a little bit of scrutiny melted away. And even in our own lives, we've seen obstacles that we thought were insurmountable but turned out to be paper tigers. They turned out to just crumple up and blow away with the least little bit of pushback. And sometimes that pushback is motivated by love. That pushback is motivated by a desire to love ourselves, love God, love our families, love our country, love our church better in the face of a threat, in the face of an obstacle. We're in this series called Love Better, and we've been talking about how it is that those early disciples, now apostles of Jesus, were learning how to love one another and love God better in those early formative days of the church. To review and remember, we saw how those disciples were loved by Jesus, but they were loved even better by him when he actually left them. And he gave them the opportunity to go out and to begin to spread the good news of his kingdom and his love into the world. We saw how God loved those apostles better when he gave them his very Holy Spirit that enabled them to stand up with courage and then deliver to the people around them the good news, to love them better by telling them that in this new age, God was pouring out his Spirit on all people and that in this new age, which includes now all people, who call on the name of the Lord, would be saved, right? All people who called on the name of the Lord would be saved. Well, those apostles, they took that power from the Holy Spirit, and they went out, and as we saw last week, they started doing things that Jesus used to do. They went out and they began to heal people, and in particular, they healed up at the temple one particular man who was well-known, as being a man who had been lame since birth and begging at that temple for many, many, many years. They healed him, and he was able to get up. And then they saw him 
jumping and what? Leaping and, come on, praising God. He's jumping and leaping and praising God. And all these people were looking around, and they are astounded at what they were seeing. Now, they did this. Those apostles did this because they wanted to show, they wanted to prove that Jesus' power and his presence was in the world and that everything they had been saying about Jesus' resurrection from the grave and everything they'd been saying about him being the Messiah that they'd all waited for, that all those things were true. And this was great news, just great news to all the thousands of people who now were taking faith in Jesus. But it was terrible news to the people who had gone to such great lengths to be rid of Jesus. Specifically, those people in the sect of Judaism called the Pharisees, and then that high priestly class called the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees, they made up the majority of what was the high religious court called the Sanhedrin. And they were these high priestly leaders who had actually been responsible for trying and sentencing Jesus to death. Now, they were those high priestly leaders, as I say, and their positions were given to them by the Roman government, by the officials in the Roman government that was occupying the, the uh, country at the time. So they had every interest in currying favor with Rome and in seeing and perpetuating this partnership that they had with the powers uh, that, that, that be. So you can imagine how distraught they were that these people were now taking faith in Jesus and calling Jesus a Messiah, a king that directly opposed their political alliance with Rome. But they also had a theological reason to oppose Jesus, and that was this. The Sadducees believed, like a lot of people do today, they were materialists. They believed that there was nothing beyond what you see. In the world, what you saw is what you got. There's no afterlife, no heaven, and certainly no resurrection. No resurrection. No one was going to be resurrected at the end of time and spend eternity with God. That was outside their theology. So they were very upset that now you had these, these followers of Jesus going around proclaiming those two very things that threatened them the most that Jesus was a Messiah and a king, and that he had been raised from the dead. So when John and Peter healed this man, this man who was well known to have been lame since birth, when they healed him, and they healed him in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, well, they took action. They sent their temple guards down there where Peter and John were speaking and, and now now preaching to this crowd about the resurrection. They sent their temple guards down there. They grabbed hold of them, and they took them into jail, made them stay overnight, and then the next day they brought them before this court, this Sanhedrin court. And they came up before those judges, those Sadducee judges, and they asked Peter and John this question, by what power? Or what name did you do this? By what power or what name? And those two terms were almost interchangeable. What power or what name did you do this? Two things. Did you preach the resurrection in Jesus? And by what power or name did you do this healing? Well, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled up with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He starts right off. He just pokes at them and says, yes, what you're seeing, this power is the power of Jesus Christ who is still in the world, but that's not all. This power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth 
whom you crucified, but whom Jesus raised from the dead. It's in that power that this man stands before you healed. In one breath, Peter affirms this power, this messianic power of Jesus. He accuses those judges of being the ones who crucified this Messiah, and then he just takes a poke at their whole theological system, saying he is the one that God raised from the dead. But then he's not done. He says, this stone, Jesus, this stone you builders rejected has become the capstone, the crown, the crown of glory. And salvation is found in no one else. Not you, not your systems, but Jesus. When these Sadducees saw Peter speaking like this, they were, they were kind of shaken. They were blown away. They didn't know really what to make of this. So much that they, they put Peter and, and John aside. They had them excuse themselves. And then they got into a little huddle and tried to figure out what they were going to do with this because they were realizing something that they couldn't put their arms around. That these guys, were uneducated, that they were unschooled, but yet they were filled with the Spirit, and they were eloquent. And besides that, they had a man sitting among them who everybody knowed had been healed, that Peter and that John had actually done this miracle, and that people had seen it. And now they were all supporting them. So they had to figure out what kind of response can we have to this. This is, this is overwhelming. What are we going to do? Well, they made a decision. In light of all of this information, all of these facts that they had around them, they called Peter and John back in. And then they did what many a powerful person or powerful group will do when confronted with a witness and with evidence and with cold, hard facts that are disagreeable to them, they used all their legal and governmental power to tell Peter and John to shut up. They said they're commanded not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. See, the powers that be commanded these guys not to speak the truth as they knew it to be. And now Peter and John had to decide whether these, these guys were a threat to be reckoned with and obeyed or whether they were paper tigers that would crumple up and blow away with a little pushback. Well, the fact is, there will always be, as there always have been, people whose worldview and interests are threatened by the news that God is real, that God is actually active in the world, and that ultimately God is in charge. In Jesus' day, in apostolic days, those powers that were most threatened were the power of the religion of the time and the political power joined together. But guess what? It isn't all that different today. In these days, probably the religion, the worldview, the system that is most threatened by Christianity, by this news, is secularism. Secularism. And that power is becoming increasingly successful at stifling speech and setting sort of the ground rules about what's acceptable and not acceptable to say and what is acceptable and not acceptable even to believe or to think. There's a case going on in Canada right now. Maybe you've heard about this. 
father, his name's Robert Kluglin. He was just put in jail for speaking up, speaking out in defense from his point of view of his daughter. And the story is, his daughter, who's now 14, a couple of years ago, decided to do what they call make a transition between being a girl to being a, a boy. Now, apparently, she came to this decision after seeing a movie <clears throat> in school. Subsequently, the school officials, the counselors, <clears throat> the administrative people there, facilitated that decision by calling her in all you know, internal communications by a, a boy's name that she had chosen. Um, they helped her to use the boys' facilities at school. And they began to do all of this without parental consent or, or permission or even knowledge. Subsequently, with, again, encouragement from people at school, she began a course of puberty-blocking drugs that shut down the body's natural process for a person going through adolescence. All of this was done on the whim, on the, on the desire of what would have been a 12-year-old, 13-year-old girl. Well, when her father heard about this, he was obviously a little upset, upset about having his parental authority usurped, but also just concern for his daughter because these are really untested waters, right? And he began to speak out about it. He began to speak up loudly about it. He began to protest vehemently about it. But judges in Canada ordered him to stop, to stop speaking. They even went so far as to tell him that he could no longer refer to his daughter as she. Well, he refused to go along with that, and so he was arrested in March, put in jail. Now, whatever we think about the transgender revolution, and it truly is one, the cases of young people, especially young girls, um, suffering with gender dysphoria, that intense feeling of discomfort uh, in their bodies, sort of being at war with their sex and who they are. And by the way, it's a real thing. It's a true thing. It really happens, and it's serious. And there's been an explosion of this, and there are all kinds of reasons why people think maybe why this is happening. But all that aside, there are some powerful truths, right, that are on this father's side. Number one being that most young people, and this is just a fact, most young people who experience gender dysphoria grow out of it if they're allowed to go through puberty. Fact. Another powerful truth. These puberty-blocking drugs and hormones given to kids does irreparable harm to their bodies at a time, a critical time in their development. Truth number three, no matter how many puberty-blocking drugs or hormones or even surgeries a person has, a Man, a boy cannot turn into a girl. A girl can't turn into a boy. That's a truth that is inscribed. It's written into our chromosomes, yes? It's written into our cells, right? It is also a truth that is written into God's created order. Yet, this man is being told by the powers that be that he may not speak the truth as he knows it to be. Look, that is the story of the church from that day to this. And it's a dilemma that any Christian, all Christians, at some level or another, some way or another, cannot escape very long. Sooner or later, what we believe is going to conflict with the world. Now, here's my caveat, okay? 
This is the thing that I shouldn't have to say, but I'm going to say it. In this church, any person, regardless of their race or their ethnic background or their religious background or their sex or their gender or their gender identification or their sexual uh, pro proclivities, it doesn't matter. Everyone is welcome to worship in this church and hear the truth of the good news of the salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Everyone is welcome in this place. However, having said that, we really are in a moment right now. We really are in a moment where those powers of secularism have a message and it is being amplified by almost every institution in our, in our culture. Schools, entertainment, books, everything. So it comes down to the church. It comes down to the people in the church to stand up and to speak the truth as we know it to be, to stand up as these apostles did, to stand up knowing that we are like these apostles. Hey, look, we're not the most educated people always. We don't know everything. We're not the most eloquent people. We may not know all of the ins and outs of the theology and the doctrine and all of that, but what we do know and what we do have is a story. We have the truth as we know it, that Jesus changes lives that God is real, that God is active in the world, and that ultimately God is in charge. And no matter how persuasive, how commanding those powers that be are, we have to tell the truth as we know it to be, just like these apostles did. Now, these apostles came before this court, <laughs> and the powers that be commanded them not to speak the truth as they knew it to be. They commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus, but Peter and John had a reply, and it was this, judge for yourselves, you judges up there, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you or rather than God. For we cannot help speaking. We cannot help speaking. We cannot help speaking what we have seen and heard. And what they'd seen and what they'd heard was that Jesus brings new life. What they'd seen and what they'd heard was that the power of the Holy Spirit had given them the courage to stand up and to speak. What they'd seen and what they'd heard convinced them that this world was not just a material place and where what you see is what you got. That this material, that this world was Holy Spirit inspired and resurrection proclaiming kingdom of God. And that those judges that they looked at up there were paper tigers. That in due course, through the power of Jesus Christ and his church, crumple up and be blown away. So next week, we're going to continue down this road with the apostles. We're going to look at how the amazing growth of the church <laughs> brought God up to, to let them know what he thought was the greatest threat to the church. But this week, Let's just remember that there really is freedom in the truth, the truth of Christ. Let's remember that we can stand on that cornerstone that is Christ and his church. And let's remember that no matter how much uh, the powers that be want us to stop telling the truth as we know it to be, we cannot. We can love God and we can love others and we will ultimately love this world better 
when we speak that truth. Amen? All right. Let's go ahead, and we're going to go into our prayer time now.